Hi all and welcome back. I think we can start the same or the next session rather. It seems there may be a little bit of a change because some people have emergencies at home, but I see that Chris is online. Um, so hi, very happy to have you on board. And um, I suggest that we can uh, start once uh, we find the chair, if Reginald is online, if not, I think it's fine for us to go ahead with the session. Um, so if that's fine with you, then uh, I suggest that uh, Chris can start his presentation now. Absolutely, thanks, Peter. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all again. Um, so my name is Chris Turner. I'm a senior lecturer in food systems at the Natural Resources Institute, University of Greenwich. And today, um, we, we uh, as part of this consultation session, uh, we would like to run a consultation on the food environment framework that we published as part of the Agriculture, Nutrition and Health um, Academy Working Group. So what I'll do is I'll just share my screen. Brilliant. So this session uh, is, uh, as I said, it's a, a consultation on the uh, Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Food Environment Working Group's conceptual framework uh, on food environments. Um, and so as you can see, I've been working on this with uh, some colleagues, some PhD students at NRI, uh, Leah Sam, uh, Samuel Warimu, uh, Lydia O'Mara, and Oli Zambo. And essentially, the uh, session aims are to introduce the uh, conceptual framework for those that may have not uh, come across it before, uh, to revisit some of the key concepts and the engagement uh, with the framework uh, in recent years, uh, and then to launch uh, the Africa Fern Consultation Survey. Uh, so at that point, I'll move to our online survey platform and I'll just run through the survey. Uh, so you get a feel for, for what it entails. And then uh, we can open to some Q&A and discussion. Um, I suspect it won't take more than sort of 10, 15 minutes to do the presentation. Uh, and then, yeah, happy to uh, to chat for the remainder of the time and take any questions. So uh, I was really fortunate um, when I uh, was undertaking my PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to be invited to lead the uh, Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Academy's Food Environment Working Group uh, back in 2016. Um, and this working group was really put together because at the time, uh, a lot of food environment research had been undertaken in high income country contexts. Um, but we'd started to see some interesting groundswell in uh, LMICs as well, although uh, we hadn't really seen much in, in the way of sort of adapting concepts and perhaps methods uh, for uh, those uh, settings. And so this is what this group was uh, put together to, to try and address. And so we had a range of, of experts who were invited to, to, to participate. Um, you can see them, some of them at the bottom there. Uh, Sinith Kadeala, who's my supervisor, Andrew Agarwal, Jennifer Coates, uh, Adam Dronowski, Karine Hawkes, and Anna Herfuth, uh, as well as uh, Helen Walls. And we had a, a research assistant, Sophia Kalamatini, as well. And so this group really got together um, over a series of, of about a year and a series of meetings to essentially uh, look at uh, approaching this. So this is a technical brief which we published uh, back in 2017 and launched at the ANH Academy Week uh, in Addis that year. And so some of these ideas and concepts were then taken forward and developed into this paper in Global Food Security, uh, where essentially we look to present some concepts and critical perspectives for food environment research and uh, launch this global framework uh, or conceptual framework with specifically with impl implications for actions in, in low middling countries. And so what we sought to set out here was to consolidate this idea around the food environment as this key interface within the wider food system. And this is one of the figures from the paper. So as you can see, we have a farm all the way on the left to flush all the way on the right hand side. And then we have the idea of this food environment as a key interface uh, or the white sphere that you can see here. Uh, and one of the key notions we put forward in this paper was the idea that food environments are not only comprised of market based food sources, which is what a lot of the literature had focused on at the time, but actually a range of diverse food sources. And here you can see some of them in, in the icon here. So we have uh, market-based sources, which is A, and these could be uh, formal or informal markets. Uh, we have own production, uh, agricultural production. This could be uh, urban, peri-urban or rural. And that's what you can see uh, under B. We had uh, wild food transfers, uh, sorry, uh, wild food harvesting uh, under C there, and then uh, gifts and transfers under D. And then the individual there, E, essentially represents, uh, uh, obviously, people and their interactions with these diverse food sources, which we uh, then consider to shape food acquisition and consumption practices. And so we sought to unpack that a, a little bit further and in a bit more detail in this conceptual framework here. Uh, there's also part of the same paper. 
And this time we have their food environment as this white box or this interface, again, within the wider food system. But here we seek to map external and personal food environment domains. And so here, the external domain contains dimensions such as food availability, food prices, vendor and product properties, and marketing and regulation. So very much the world that's sort of out there that we interact with as individuals, if you like. And then on the right-hand side, we have the personal domain. And here we have dimensions such as food accessibility, food affordability, convenience, and desirability. And interactions between these various domains and dimensions are what we, as I said earlier, what we consider to shape food acquisition, consumption practices. Um, and so this is how we sort of uh, approach that, really grounded in a sort of socio-ecological approach, looking at interactions between people and their environment. So it's fair to say that since then, our conceptual thinking has continued to evolve. Um, uh, as I said, the, the, the original framework was put together as part of the working group. And we then sort of went away and started to apply and test some of these concepts. Um, here is a paper that we uh, worked on with the uh, team at the Drives of Food Choice program as part of a working group that they put together, uh, really looking to approach the principal investigators from the 15 different projects uh, across their portfolio, uh, which were across 12 low middle income countries, and really start to understand um, what their perspectives were on the framework in terms of, you know, how did it relate and resonate with the studies that they were undertaking at the time and some of the emerging evidence. And so this was really sort of a, if you like, a critical appraisal of the framework as, as people were reflecting back on it from these projects. Here's an exploder view of the framework. So we have the external and personal and then the various uh, domains. Uh, obviously, as I was undertaking my PhD research, I'd also started to think through this uh, a little bit more. And I, uh, my PhD research was in Perium and Hyderabad in India, we really saw their huge, uh, huge driver around uh, food acquisition and consumption was food safety. And this was also reflected in the wider literature. So I started to think through, okay, maybe food safety, which was previously under vendor and product properties, maybe maybe that might be um, a, a dimension in, in of itself within the external domain, particularly around adulteration and contamination concerns. And then in the personal food environment, we recognize the role of social capital, uh, again, through uh, some of that field work in Hyderabad, uh, really focusing on networks and trust and reciprocity and the role of known people within food environments and those social relations that are really important in shaping what people eat. And this is something that until this point hadn't really been addressed within the, the food environment literature. Other aspects included peer influence, particularly interpersonal dynamics, um, and whether that was within households uh, between parents and children, for example, uh, or, or, or the relationships within, um, let's say, community settings. Um, so as I said, we then work with the Drivers of Food Choice program uh, to map those uh, perspectives of the principal investigators from those studies. Uh, in the external food environment, we uh, identified uh, through this process the, the importance of wider food system drivers, here very much about climate, land use and tenure systems, agrobiodiversity, um, as well as stability uh, in terms of seasonality and, and in terms of food security. Um, the wider food system drivers, I think, is sort of more towards the production end, you might say, uh, of food environments. Uh, and then stability, really just capturing that, that change over time. And then within the personal food environment, we also identified a number of aspects you can see here, including e equity and gender dynamics, uh, social forces, and then perceptions of food safety and quality. So very much the, the kind of... Um, sort of uh, individual perceptions on that external food safety uh, in the external food environment domain. So uh, the framework has since seen some wider uptake as well. I've cherry picked just a couple of examples here. Um, so this is a paper uh, that we worked on with some colleagues from UN Nutrition with Denise and Steinecker. And essentially um, they'd engage with the, the framework during the COVID-19 pandemic to try and map some of the possible impacts of COVID-19 uh, on people's experiences uh, of food environments. And the way, uh, here's the, the framework that they developed essentially, and I won't go into it in detail here, but if you're interested, you, you can go and, uh, and, and check out the paper. Um, and I thought the really interesting thing here was that we were able to use this approach to really map some policy entry points that might build more resilient food environments and harness some positive dietary related behaviors that were manifested through the pandemic, um, which was perhaps a bit, again, a bit different to um, a lot of the literature at the time, which was obviously focusing on the negative impacts, let's say, of COVID-19 on people's experiences of food environments. Um, but here we map these 10 policy entry points to the external and personal food environment uh, domains. Other examples, here we have um, the, uh, the Inishenti framework and report for, on food systems for children and adolescents by UNICEF and GAIN. Um, and so this is from 2018. 
this was subsequently published in Global Food Security here by Raza and colleagues. Um, and really what they did here was put forward this framework uh, where they mapped the external and personal food environment domains and integrated them with wider food supply chain aspects on the left there in green. And then behaviors of caregivers of children and adolescents as this key mediator on that pathway of, of the diets of children and adolescents. So it's really interesting to see how they've sort of taken those personal and external uh, food environment domains and then integrated them with this wider sort of uh, more towards a food systems uh, framework, let's say. And then most recently, this is an example uh, from just a couple of months ago. So the Swedish public health authorities uh, have also engaged with the framework and, and adapted it for their own purposes. And here you can see a sort of diagram on the left. Um, and they use this to uh, conduct a review of all the literature in Sweden, essentially. Um, and they're now reporting back these findings to, uh, to the Swedish government. So it's just to show some examples of how people have been engaging and adapting uh, the conceptual framework since its publication. Um, Amana also recently conducted an impact case study on the, the original Food Environments Working Group and, and the outputs. I won't go into all the detail here. That this is you can find this on the uh, Working Group webpage on the NH Academy webpage. But essentially, uh, what was really nice here was the, the the team took a timeline sort of approach, really mapping engagement with policy and practice, uptake by researchers, uh, as well as students and and some of the Working Group outputs. And so as you can see, um, there's, there's been a number of engagements over the past couple of years or so. Um, and this really led to uh, the earlier this summer, um, the uh, a &H Academy consultation that we held in Malawi and also online, uh, which was a side event as part of the conference. And we really, really here, much like today, we sought to revisit the, the framework um, and get people's perspectives and experiences of how they've used the framework. So this is some of the outputs that you can see here. Again, this was a kind of interactive workshop, but the, the main line of questioning was around how have you sort of used the framework? Uh, what seems to be working uh, well or what works from the different studies that have applied it? And also perhaps what's missing or, or what would people change essentially? And as you can see, we had some really nice engagement um, across the three areas and some really interesting discussions. And thanks for everybody who was, uh, was there in person uh, or online and, and participated in that process. So that brings us to today and the, the FERN consultation. And today we're really hoping to learn from uh, the community here at the, at the FERN about how uh, the framework has been used, as I said before, what works and what could be improved. So given that the, the FERN um, has such a large number of participants and that we've already had some sort of qualitative feedback and discussion at the a &H Academy week, here we decided to go with a different format. So we've got a short seven to 10 minute online survey um, there are 10 questions in the survey that really focus on the framework itself. And then there's a couple of sort of bookends of, of questions about in the start there. We have questions around uh, personal information, that type of thing, uh, just to get to know essentially who you are. Uh, and then at the end, just a question around whether uh, you're happy for us to uh, feature you on a mailing list to keep you updated with future progress and thinking uh, from and, and activities from the working group. Um, but essentially, there are 10 core questions about the framework. And we'd like to open this consultation and launch it today. Uh, the deadline uh, will be in a month's time on the 3rd of December. Um, there is a QR code here, which you can use uh, with a handheld device uh, to access the survey on a, on a phone or a tablet, for example. There's also a link, and I will, in a moment, I'll paste a link in the chat. Um, but before I do that, I'd just like to uh, move across to the survey itself so you get a feel um, for what the survey looks like. So obviously there's some information in the beginning here, um, just around uh, the, the survey itself, uh, a link, DOI link to the original paper, if, if you're interested. Uh, there's the uh, also the link to the working group webpage where you can find that impact case study amongst other information, blog posts and that type of thing. Um, so from there, sorry, can you still see my screen? Can I just check? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, so here we have uh, this key information in the beginning, obviously name, title, organization, and all the usual things you would expect to fill out in an online survey, email address. Again, this is these are all optional questions. So if you do want to submit it sort of without giving all that detail, that's completely fine. But when we get to question seven is really when we start to uh, focus on the framework itself. So first, we'd like to know in what ways you've used the framework. Uh, here you can see it just for reference again. And here we've given some example questions, uh, sorry, some responses that you might want to fill out, but there's also an opportunity to add others as well. 
Um, obviously, we've tried to preempt what some of them might be, but there may be others that, we're, that we haven't thought of. So please just let us know. Question eight then uh, unpacks a bit more and gives you an opportunity just to tell us more about some of the projects, whether it's the name or a brief description or any relevant links or DOIs to material that you might think we'd be interested in seeing, which it really encourage you to sort of think that through and fill that out. Um, then we move on to uh, more questions around sort of specifics around countries uh, that, you, that you may have uh, addressed uh, or used the framework in uh, about what type of food environments you may have applied it on in terms of whether it's market based, cultivated, wild, online, home, school or in store, for example. Uh, or th again, there's options for others here. Uh, 11 is around the population, target population of any research that you've been involved in. 12 is in terms of uh, what did you find to be most useful, i.e. what works. Uh, 13, what could be improved. Uh, 14, uh, do you have any specific feedback? Then either 14 is on the external food environment and then 15 on the personal food environment domain. So really sort of drilling down into specifics of the framework. Um, 16 is then about, you know, have you adapted it for your own purposes? Uh, obviously, we've seen some adaptations that are presented now. We know there are some others, but we also know that there's highly likely to be some that we're not aware of. And so we'd really like to know if you've adapted it and, and how, because that, that might help as well. And then finally, um, you know, what are the question, uh, sorry, conceptual frameworks have you found to be useful when studying food environments? Uh, and here's just an opportunity um, uh, to share any authors or links again for frameworks. Uh, again, we I think we have a, ha a good handle on a, a lot of the literature, but it'd be really interesting to know uh, what you think is useful and what you've engaged with too. Um, so finally then just, you know, would, would you be interested in joining the mailing list essentially? So that is, um, that's a survey. It, as I said, we pilot tested it. It takes between seven and 10 minutes, but obviously it depends on the level of detail uh, in the responses. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll share the link to the survey in the chat and then perhaps we can open to Q&A and, and any other discussion, uh, happy to uh, to discuss. Perfect, thanks so much, Chris. We will also be advertising uh, this on social media through the a and Academy's accounts as well as the uh, Natural Resources Institute at Greenwich. And as I said, it'd be open for a month, so there's plenty of time to to go away and sort of think about it or, or take time to sort of think through the, the, the responses, let's say. Excellent. I think we're all very much aware of the importance of uh, having that framework and uh, good to see that it's been applied and used in so many different ways and forms, even taken up by uh, places like Sweden. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I'm actually based in Sweden, but I had nothing to do with that, I have to say. They, they, <laughs> it was news to me when they, they reached out. So, yeah, it's really nice to see. Well, we all know how to find you, I guess. Um, and Chris, for your information, I think Celia's uh, email is in the chat box somewhere. So, uh, if you could, uh, I'll, go and, I'll go and dig that out then. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much then for, for the session. I would urge everyone to please, yes, indeed, go online, uh, check out the, uh, the Google form. And if you have experience with the framework, just uh, share the experience because it's all building that body of work. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.